Welcome Crater fans, this is a talk from Crater Remote Comp Mobile Edition. This talk focuses on building mobile apps using JavaScript. You can find out more information about upcoming Crater Remote Confs at conf.crater.io. Enjoy the talk. All right, welcome back to session two for our third day. And this talk is about using React Native with D3. And uh, so I've got Harry um, Wolf with us. And uh, he is an engineer at Today Ticks. And he's been using React Native. Uh, he used it for six months at his previous job. And he's kind of doing a lot of front end React stuff uh, where he's at now. So uh, I'll let him take it away from here. Cool. Yeah, thank you, Josh, for having me on today. Uh, very excited. Uh, happy Friday to you and to everyone else listening in. Uh, but the, yeah, and then with that being said, let's just uh, jump into the talk. Um, everything looking good? Yeah. All right. So welcome, everyone. Uh, this is my talk about React Native and uh, D3.js. Uh, you can't see me, but I'm standing, so I can pretend that I'm presenting even more. Um, so, as Josh said, my name is Harry Wolf. Uh, I'm currently the web development lead at todaytix.com. Um, I also blog, tweet, and publish open source code, all with the same wonderful angle, so you'll have no problem forgetting it. Uh, this talk is the spiritual successor of a talk that I gave a couple months ago. Uh, that talk was more of an introduction to React Native, if you didn't have any experience with it. Um, if you don't know any, this, this talk itself is going to be a little bit more advanced than that one. It'll be building on the uh, information shared in that talk. But uh, if you want to get some more background, I definitely encourage you to check out the uh, previous slide deck. Um, so uh, as Josh said, uh, at my last job, uh, I worked at a company called Sharpie. Uh, there, I helped build their new iOS application from the ground up, built entirely in React Native. Um, this is in the App Store. Uh, you can see some screen grabs here. Uh, you can see the application in action. And again, everything you see here is uh, built entirely in React Native, uh, including these graphs. Uh, and it's these graphs at the top of here that directly inspired this talk, where I get to actually share what I learned and like was able to do in there and uh, let you be able to make graphs similar to that in your own React Native application. So uh, again, this is going to be a more advanced topic, but uh, a more advanced talk. But uh, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Hey, I uh, Harry, real sorry? quick. I don't think uh, your slides are advancing. All we see is just your, your, uh, yeah. Now they're changing. What a bummer. Yeah, I don't. Maybe, you, maybe you went full screen yeah. and it wasn't sharing it or something. There we go. Now we see the charts. Do you still see it now? Yeah. Okay. Do you see a video? Yeah. No. We see Here's your. The video. We see your notes actually. So we're seeing like the keynote app. So how do I get this to be full screen then? I can present it like this. It won't be the best, but I can do that. Yeah, it's up to you. I mean. I mean, you need to see the the slides. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. That's a lot better. All right, cool. I'll do it this way. Whoops, what did I do? Um, okay. This will be different. <laughs> uh, whoops. Okay, again, um, please don't cheat on the side. Can I hide the side, actually, so you don't see the uh, navigator? Oh, come on. Nope. Slide only. Look at that. Just like full screen, but not. Okay. So, uh, again, this is the uh, Chartbeat iOS application. Thank you, by the way, Josh, for the heads up. Appreciate that. Um, here are the graphs that I mentioned that you didn't get to see beforehand. Uh, fun. Uh, I don't like live coding. It scares me. So, this is just all videos here. Um, oops, I edited that. Cool. So, I can't advance the slide now. <laughs> All right. So uh, to get us on the same page, what is React Native? 
So React Native is a framework for building native apps with React. Um, this is straight from the website. Uh, React Native lets you build mobile apps using only JavaScript. So you use the same design uh, as you would with React, letting you compose a rich mobile UI from declarative components. Um, and this is straight from the React Native website. This is what a React Native component looks like. Instead of divs and spans, you're using view and text components. Okay, great notifications. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Um, okay, so let's talk about D3.js. Uh, this I'm going to go into a little bit more depth. Uh, as you might not have as much knowledge about D3.js. Um, so again, according to its website, D3.js is a JavaScript library for manipulating documents based on data. Now, when they say documents, by default, D3 means uh, HTML, SVG, and CSS. Um, and you can take some data, give it to D3, and then it can output it into these environments. Uh, here's just a screen grab from D3.js's homepage where you can see just examples of graphs made in D3.js. I'm sure you've seen this around the internet before. Um, now, what's important to know is that D3.js recently came out with version 4.0. And that's a big deal, especially for us wanting to use it in React Native um, because it's now modular. Uh, D3 is now uh, many small libraries that are designed to work together. In D3 version 3, it was one monolithic library where all the kitchen sink was included and you couldn't really decide what was in there. Why that matters for us is before uh, D3 version 3, it included modules that required access, it required a browser. And as you know with React Native, there is no browser in React Native. Um, but now with D3 version 4, we can just pick and choose what modules we want to use in making our graphs, um, which is great. So we don't have to worry about all of the uh, HTML uh, libraries or uh, CSS libraries. We can just pick and choose the ones that we need. Uh, for our use cases, we're going to focus on two libraries, uh, the scales library or module and the shapes module. Uh, and let's go into a little bit more detail about those because we'll be directly using those later on in this talk. So the D3 scale module um, has in it a continuous scales function. Uh, and a continuous scales maps a continuous quantitative input domain to a continuous output range. And that's a fancy way of saying given a value from the domain, return the corresponding value from the range. So what does that look like? So we have D3, we use the scale linear function to create a scale instance, and then we can set the domain, and then we can set the range. So this is on the y-axis. So let's say you want to make a graph plotting out test scores from zero to 100, and the height of your screen is 640 pixels. You set the domain 0 to 100, you set the range of 0 to 640, so that if you, someone got a 50 on their test score, that would be outputted onto your screen at 320 pixels. And the same thing for 80. And this is very handy when trying to make translations from data, your domain, to your uh, native application, which is your range of pixels on the screen. Uh, also in the D3 scale module are time scales. And these are exactly like continuous scales, except the, they have a temporal domain, uh, being that the domain values are dates rather than numbers. Again, this looks very much similar, uh, except the domain are now date objects uh, instead of just integers. And again, the same principle, given a value from the domain, you get one from the range. Uh, scale time. Uh, are most useful when you're plotting over time, which we'll be using later on in this talk. Now let's talk about the D3 shape module. Uh, this module is pretty awesome. Uh, it provides a variety of shape generators for your convenience. Um, one of those shape generators that it provides is a line generator. And this line generator can be used 
uh, to compute the D attribute of an SVG path element. So let's do a slight diversion into SVG land. Uh, so I'm not going to go in depth in this. Uh, there's a link at the bottom of this slide to read more about SVG and the path object. But uh, in the world of SVG, when you're actually creating your vector graphics, uh, there is a path element. Uh, paths allow you to create complex shapes by combining multiple straight lines or curved lines. And the shape of a path element is defined by one attribute called D. So this is the D3 scale line generator in action. You have here, this is an example straight from the D3 shape readme. You have a array of data. You have D3.line, which is creating a line generator instance. Um, and then you have an X and Y uh, functions that set how the line generator should compute. the. So when you give the data into the line generator, it'll the X and Y tell the line generator how to output the domain values to the range values. So in this case, we're actually outputting uh, very directly the uh, domain values, d.date, d.value. There's no real transversion there. So that's why uh, you would usually include a, a scale object inside of there to make that conversion from domains to ranges. So that was just a lot of words, but uh, it's a lot of information trying to condense it really hard. Uh, um, so at the bottom here, you can see that we're passing in the data into the line generator, and now it pops out this long string and that's actually the value that is put inside of your SVG's paths D attribute. Huzzah! Well done. If you're still with me, I applaud you because I am out of breath and my voice is hoarse. I'm taking a glass of water. Okay. And now to the fun. So how does D3JS work with React Native? So come with me on a stroll. So there is this library called Art. Uh, link to the library at the bottom. Art is a retained mode vector drawing API. That's straight from their readme. Uh, what that really means is that you can create SVG vector graphics using an object-oriented model of programming uh, rather than having to hand write your SVG. So here we have an art surface, art group. We have an art rectangle, size 100 to 100, uh, 100 by 100 moving into X10, Y10, playing with blue, then adding into the group. What that looks like is this. So when you actually render that art code, you'll output something very close to this, and you don't have to actually write this code yourself. So that's cool, that's fun. Uh, but what's cooler than art? Well, React Art. <laughs> so React Art is a JavaScript library for drawing vector graphics using React. Uh, which is to say that it provides declarative and reactive bindings to the art library. And that's what React Art looks like. Uh, this is, again, when you review the slides later, you'll see how very similar this code is. This is just provides you a React interface to making SVG uh, graphics. So you have service, group, rectangle, same deal. Okay, so we have Art. We have React Art. Can you guess what's coming next? React Native Art, if you guess that, you get $100 of imaginary money. Um, so yeah, so someone actually, uh, someone being the Facebook or uh, the Facebook team, uh, made uh, native bindings to the React Art Library for React Native. This is a screen grab directly from the React Native repo. Uh, this is upstream in the library itself. And you can see here, um, all the native code required for React Native Art. Um, just to be clear, uh, in this talk, I'm going to be focusing just on iOS just because for sake of brevity, but React Native Art works completely the same way in Android. Um, and again, this is the code for React Native Art. The actual uh, React components look exactly the same, just where you import them from is just off of the React Native uh, module. So cool, so we're gonna take this knowledge and now uh, actually make something with it. We're gonna make a graph. So uh, the first question might be, what are we making? Uh, we are going to make uh, a very simple uh, weather forecast application uh, where you can put in your address, it'll go hit an API, and then it'll graph for you uh, the weather forecast for the next upcoming week. And it also animates, and you will also learn 
how to animate your graphs because what's more fun than making a graph is making it move. Uh, awesome. Uh, so this uh, this uh, that application is actually entirely open source. It's uh, public on my repo right now. Uh, feel free to clone it down, fork it, open an issue, do whatever you want with it. Uh, but it's there for you to learn from. Uh, each commit in the repo is made um, such that they work standalone. So you can see the progression of code uh, that was done to make this application. Uh, and then this talk will in some ways echo that progression as well. So let's build. Um, before we can build, we have to actually link the React Native Art Library to our iOS application. And I believe this is true for Android as well. Uh, what this means is that, you know, by default, React Native comes with many components uh, included by default. Um, but they don't include everything because they felt that it would cause unnecessary bloat because not every application needs to have support. So when you actually use the React Arc JavaScript code, you actually have to link the native code in your native application for it to actually work. And there's a whole guide on the React Native website teaching how to do that. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, and that's the only prerequisite for using React Native Arc in your application. So let's, we're gonna jump into some code now. Um, this entire view that you see in front of you is the weatherpage.js component. Um, you can see here, it's a regular React Native component, has a view, has a header, and then it has this uh, weather graph component. And this is where we actually see our nice plain D3 graph for the first time. Okay, so let's actually jump into the weather graph component. Uh, this, is the, this is inside of the weather graph component now in its render function. Uh, you can see here we have the view, surface, group, and shape. This is exactly what we saw earlier on in this talk. And these are the React Native art components that are used to actually render out our D3 paths D attribute. Did you follow that? Okay, good. So right here we have the D attribute is being given this line path variable. This is being taken off of our state. So the question is where and how is this line path value being computed. So let's jump up. Uh, inside of weathergraph.js, I have these two uh, in component will mount and in component will receive props. I have this compute next state function just to catch both of those cases. Um, so let's actually jump into this compute next state function. Here it is. Um, again, this is where the state is being set, which causes that re-render. And you can see here this line path uh, dot path attribute is being given onto the state and that's being made up here uh, on this graph utils that create line graph. Um, and we're, we have this graph utils function uh, module with a function on with a function on it called create line graph and you give it some data and it spits back this line graph with one property called path which has the d attribute. Um, so the question is where is this data coming from? Uh, so as I mentioned before because we actually have to you know use d3 to make actually uh, D3 needs data to actually make the line path. So this data, as I mentioned before, is coming from forecast.io, uh, which is a weather website. Uh, they actually have a awesome API, uh, very easy to use, very easy to register for an API key. Uh, it, was a, it was the easiest thing to use. It took me longer to find forecast.io than to actually uh, use it. Um, so when you actually hit the uh, endpoint, this is what it looks like. Uh, you get back this big JSON blob of a weather forecast for a given uh, latitude and longitude that you pass in the URL. Uh, in this JSON response, there's many properties. The one that we're focusing on today is the daily property, which gives you back a data property, which is an array of objects that tell you the weather forecast for the next, for the next week uh, for the given latitude and longitude. So daily data is an array of these objects, uh, and that's what we're actually passing into the create line graph function. So graph data dot daily dot data. Then we also have this X accessor and a Y accessor. Here I just kind of included them in line so you can see what's actually going on. Uh, this is also 
It may look like a premature optimization, but you'll see later on when we get to animating why it's done this way. But the X accessor is given into this create line graph function as an easy way to say where it should get the X value and the Y accessor the same way. So D dot time and D dot temperature max. You can see here, if you go back a slide, there's D dot time at the top and then D dot time, D dot temperature max somewhere in the middle. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's now jump into this graph utils module and in particular the create line graph function. So here's the graph utils module. At the top, we're importing those uh, two standalone D3 modules that we talked about earlier, um, D3 scale and D3 shape. Uh, we're also using D3 array, which are just helper functions like the D3 equivalent of, lo of a low dash or underscore. Uh, and then here we have the actual create line graph function. Please do not be overwhelmed. This is pretty straightforward. Um, so what is this create line graph function doing? So the first thing that it does is it's making the scale x function. This is the same thing that we saw earlier on. We're using scale time to make a scale function where we can use a domain of date objects. And here you can see we're using the first date objects time and then the last date objects time. And then the range, because we're going you know, from left to right, is uh, zero to the width of our uh, native application screen. And that's being passed in as well as you can customize the uh, width and height to your fitting. So that means that you know, given the, if you were to then invoke the scale x function with the last uh, date, with the last data time value, you get out the max width of your screen. And then we're doing the same thing. Then we're also making the uh, Y scale function. And here we're making just a very simple linear scale um, where we have the domain, which is the extent of all Y values. So an extent is a fancy way of getting the min and max at the same time. And the reason why we're doing uh, the extent of all the Y values rather than just doing zero to max Y is because we actually want to have greater fidelity into the differences in temperatures that we're graphing over. If the differences in temperatures is only like, you know, two or five degrees and our domain is zero to like 80, it'll be very hard to see that difference just because of what you're graphing. So instead, we're just going to zoom in onto that graph and just give us the min Y value and the max Y value. You can see we're using this dot nice function, which is a helper utility in D3 that if you have a domain of like, 63 to like 78, that dot nice function will change that to 60 to 80 to give it a nice round feel. Uh, and then in the range, we're inverting the height, uh, we're inverting it to actually um, fix the rendering from D3's axes into iOS's axes. Um, and then here we have uh, the D3 shape line generator. And again, this is what we talked about earlier. We have the X getter and the Y getter, where we're using the X accessor on the date object uh, to actually get the X value, which we're then passing into the X scale to get that value in our range, which is the output uh, field in our application. And the same thing for uh, every Y value. We have the Y accessor to the scale Y, which we then can use to then have the line generator output the right uh, D3, the right SVG path D attribute, which we then return at the bottom. And I am out of breath because that was just so much graphing things. Oh my God. But after you get through all that, you get a D3 graph in React Native. That's awesome. I'm ecstatic. But we're not done. <laughs> we have a nice graph but we don't really know, we can't really make sense of it. So how do you make sense of a graph? You add some labels. So uh, let's do that for our graph right now. Let's actually add some axes and ticks to actually uh, annotate the graph with the information that it's actually showing. So let's go back to our graph utils uh, module where before all we were returning was the line shapes path value. For the axes and the ticks, uh, we need a little bit more information. So we'll actually, uh, oh, good. 
that is not showing up. I see it in here, but I don't see it there. That is weird. Well, I'm gonna jump into the code then just to show that because that is annoying. Uh, can you see my Atom editor? Is that possible? Oh, you can't. Uh, we don't see it right now. No. Why is that? I see it in the in the thumbprint, right? Yeah. And it was working last night. Well, in any case, uh, that sucks. <laughs> Do you have another right. screen hooked up or something? No, that's the uh, fascinating thing about it all. Oh, How do well, I... maybe, maybe you can reshare your screen and then and yeah. choose like yeah, full desktop Let's rather than an entire screen. Cool. Thank you for your uh, tips, by the way. Um, oh my god. I have not seen any of your comments before, and now I just did. So I'm glad that I was able to read your mind with a dot nice method. Um, so we have here the graph utils function, and before it was just the path property, and now we're actually going to return going to return this uh, property as well, which is us mapping over the array of data and simply passing every um, X and Y value through our scale object to get the final uh, X and Y coordinates that will be rendered to our iOS application. Um, let me just, oh my God. Let me just go back to sharing just the screen in case other things pop up. Very cool. Very cool. All right. Um, so then we're going to take, all right, we're back. We're good. Yeah, cool. So we're then going to use that ticks property from the line graph function that it returns to actually just use straight up React Native code to create our axes and ticks. Uh, I think there's a way to do um, SVG text and stuff with React Native art. I haven't done that, found no need for that. So I just went straight to React Native itself. Uh, but you can see here, uh, we're simply using the tick.x value to directly position our ticks on the axes, where we have the elements positioned absolutely, uh, and then we just use plain old React Native and style sheets. And the same is true for our Y axes and our Y ticks. Uh, you can see here we have, uh, we're setting the left and the top property of our tick styles object with the tick.x and ticks.y. We have some offset here to make it just look pretty when it's actually outputted. Um, and then for that dot that you see there as well, even more clearly, we're using directly tick.x, tick.y. Uh, and that was an easy, very easy way to make your axes and ticks to give more information to your graph. So now let's get to the fun part, the part that you've probably all been waiting for. Uh, let's get things moving. And I mean that very literally. <laughs> uh, so to add some animations, we're going to add uh, these control button components. And uh, you can see there I'm at the top for max and win. And what these do is that you change whether you should be graphing the temperature max value or the temperature min value. So then just to go through the sequence of events of what happens, you know, you tap on this control button, which calls the this.setMax function, which is just a bound curried version of our onChange function, which then updates our state with the new show max value, which causes a re-render, as you know, with React. With, with React. Um, if we were rendering the temperature min before, we would have our Y accessor be a function that returns our temperature min. Now, this is where it looked like premature optimizations before, but I just had the benefit of foresight, which if only every project you could have that, we'd all be a much happier people. Um, but this lets us easily customize what we're graphing by just changing the function and what it returns. So now that we're saying, you know, show the max value, this function then jumps up here and returns instead d.temperature max. And then after that, it causes weather graph to re-render with these new graph properties on it. Cool. Still can't see your comments, so I'm just going to keep going. <laughs> um, so let's jump into weather graph when it actually re-renders with these new properties. Again, we have weather graph, we have this 
nice utility setup with compute next state. Uh, and then inside of compute next state, we saw this before as well, where it used, you know, graph utils dot create line graph to get the line graph. Uh, but we're actually going to have to expand on this function to actually make things animate. So past that initial set state, there's more code now. So the first thing that we have to do is just a first time setup wherein if this is the first time that we're rendering this graph, cache the line graph object so that we can use it later on. And you'll see where you'll see where we use this previous graph just in a second. Um, this is a nice little performance optimization where we're not gonna re-render or reanimate if our properties are the same. Uh, the only reason when our properties would be different is if that Y access or function changes. So that's a very important thing to be aware of. And then down here, we're getting our path from value and our path to value. Now these, these values are the D string attributes that is the line path string. So that's that big, long, crazy string that D3 generates for us. So that's why we have this dot previous uh, graph dot path because we have to know where we're animating from and where we're animating to. Um, here we're doing some stuff with animating that you'll see in a second. And then here we're doing something which is not exactly a hack, but it's a shortcut where we're opting into using React Native's layout animation module which allows us to easily animate all of our axes and ticks when we also animate our D3 graph. If we wanted to have more finite control here, we could have used the animation module in React Native, but this has pretty much the same effect. Um, a gotcha with this is that layout animation can't animate. <clears throat> Hold on, get some water. Um, Layout animation can't animate text components. So you should wrap all your text components in view components for it to animate here. And this is just some custom configuration so that it animates along with our D3 line graph uh, path attribute. So then down here is where we actually do the magic of uh, animating the D3 line graph. Um, to do animations here, we're actually directly using the art module. This is like the, the real like primitive just art module because uh, inside of there, there's a morph component which allows you to tween from one path value to another. And if you've done tween, uh, animation tweens before, you can set a delta of like where it should render to. But here we're actually making um, the morph tween instance where we actually set up where it's tweening from and tweening to. After our state is updated, we kick off our animation with our animation loop. And then again, we're caching, which is now our current line graph as our previous line graph, because we'll use that next time that we animate. So let's jump into uh, the animate function. Everything in here is wrapped inside of the request animation frame function for performance reasons, uh, just so that we have everything nicely queued and fluid. Uh, here, this, is, this, this whole function is very typical of tweening animation loops, but you know, if you don't have a start time, you use the timestamp given from request animation frame. Um, here we're computing the delta for how long in the animation that we're in. This is the timestamp of uh, where we are now minus our start time. Um, once we have our delta, if our delta is above one, that means that our animation should be complete. Like we should be done animating, we should be our next state, and like everything should be done. Um, here, just to be safe, we set the state to be this dot previous graph dot path, just to make sure that it ends up where it should be. And then we return early to stop our animation loop. However, if we're still animating, then we actually have to set the tween value of our line path transition. And here we're directly accessing the line path instance in our state object and tweening it according to the delta of how long we are in in our animation. After we've updated this tween, uh, we can then set the state to cause our re-render with that new tween state and then kick off our animation to start 
the next frame to be rendered. And then that gives you this nice and fun animation. So the, the line is uh, moving with our tween function and our numbers are moving with layout animation. And that is my talk, uh, React Native and D3JS. Uh, the slides are online. I stealthily published them last night in the cover of darkness. Um, I'm probably gonna follow up this talk with a blog post as well, pretty much reiterating what I talked about here, just in written form. And uh, thank you so much for uh, tuning in. And thank you, Josh. Yeah, awesome. Good job, Harry. Um, and now, a brief word from our sponsors before you see the rest of the talk. Raygun, spend more time building great software and less time fighting it. Raygun helps keep a watchful eye on your web and mobile applications and tells you when problems arise. You can learn more at raygun.com. NativeScript, backed by Telerik by Progress, is an open source framework for building truly native mobile apps with TypeScript and Angular 2. Use your web skills to get native UI and performance on iOS and Android. Enjoy the rest of the talk. We don't have any questions but, yet. Was I just that thorough? Maybe, maybe you were. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I can, I mean, so, yeah, I mean that, that I, yeah, it is a lot to take in. That is absolutely sure. That was me learning over like four, that's, that's four months of learning, like on the job, full time, condensed into 30 minutes. So uh, it's also a lot of like disparate topics combined into one. So uh, I am not insulted in the slightest. Thank you, Carlitos. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah it was good. I, I like I like the way that you did it with videos and code snippets and kind of highlighting the parts of the code. Um, definitely. Oh, that one part was visible. That was weird. Yeah. But uh, uh, so, we do, so we do have one question. Does the morph plugin work with other SVG shapes? I don't know. Uh, the so it works directly with. Um, the path element and in particular the paths d attribute shape where it can take one d attribute and morph it into a next one so in that sense and like a path element is the primitive upon which all svg elements are built on top but you can replicate any svg element with a path element they're just nice uh wrappers for that so in that sense it does work with that, but you still have to just use a path element to make that morph capable. Um, I don't know if it works with like rectangle or circle, but you could have that same path and use that for um, uh, for, for morphing purposes. Uh, there's there's if you Google React Native um, art uh, trans, uh, transitions, there's this great blog post where I definitely learned most of my stuff from. I forget the name of Bought, like brown field or something like that brownie field uh where uh it was published last year so some of the information is a little out of date but most of it's still very um current but that's definitely a good place to start nice all right uh there's another question from ryan uh can you give a brief overview of what you can do with react art you showed it in the context of graph, but it looks like you can do a lot more. Um, Have you played with it more? <laughs> React Art, I've only used within the context of React Native. Um, so when in the actual like uh, Chartbeat iOS application, uh, if you recall, there was like some like uh, uh, fade transitions between different graphs. Uh, and that was actually just done with the animation library where I would have two, I'd have multiple React Native surfaces and it took me a while to realize this, but like if you use the animated uh, module in React Native, you can arbitrarily make other components animatable. So like by default, you have animated.view, animated.text uh, or whatever. You can actually 
pass in reactnative.art.group into animated.create to make a animated group. And then you can actually just use that as any other animated component to actually have it do animated transitions like opacity and other things inside of there. Uh, which is like another, like that's more in there, but uh, yeah, it doesn't directly answer the question, but I, I talked for, about it. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm gonna move this one over. What DB? The question uh, was, what DB were you using for the app? Redux. Okay. And it's, enti it's entirely Redux. Um, yeah, that I mean that was the hardest thing is figuring out how to store that data uh, in the Redux store because it's massive and it's large, but uh, and it's also real time. So it's a large data dump that updates on an interval. And then I would use Redux connect function that would cause the components to re-render then update the UI. And I got into a lot of issues where if you, if you do mess around with React Native art, uh, it's definitely more of the Wild West in the React Native world just by nature of itself. Um, but you'll encounter very uh, quickly when you step outside of the lines, you'll get this like red screen that says, uh, cannot parse JSON null or something like that. And it means that something's misconfigured, like the path attribute is wrong or it's null and it just like says barf and just like throws it up. So a lot of my time was spent debugging, uh, making sure that those cases never happen because you'd have this swipe animation, which would cause the transitions to occur, which would cause different data to load, which would then cause that to update. And I had many headaches and Advil was my new investment in what I could, uh, make myself sane with. <laughs> um, i trying to think what else. Uh, yeah, I haven't, I, that was literally the only two modules that I played with is D3 scales, D3 shape, because all that I needed. Um, there's so many other ones that you could probably include. Uh, and like, because now D3 is modular, there's no preventing you from doing so. Um, and SD, and like there's, a React Native uh, open source component that just does SVGs generically that just wraps React Native art and lets you just like render SVGs. Uh, and like just having that primitive building block just enables so much that you can do in your application. So rather than having to worry about importing PNGs uh, or JPEGs, you can just have it in an SVG and render that in your React Native application and not worry about different assets for everything. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess the advantage of the SVG is that it should scale properly. You can arbitrarily set its width and height as long as the ratio is correct. So it's a vector yeah. graphic. Indeed. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Read those online. Um, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, uh, did I invite you to the Slack chat room, Harry? No. No. Okay. I'll get you in there. And if anyone has any other questions, uh, they can just ping you in Slack as well. Um, cool. Yeah. Uh, or also feel free to ping me on Twitter. I tweet both sense and nonsense. So all things are equal. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Well, <laughs> thank Ryan. you for the talk. It was uh, super informative. And uh, I think we, we all learned something there. Um, a lot of At least cool one thing. I hope just one show. small thing. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we'll take a break. Uh, the next talk starts at 3 p.m. Eastern, so about 17, 18 minutes or so. We'll get started with that talk, and we'll be discussing uh, using Meteor as a backend for React Native with uh, Spencer Carley. So. All right, guys. Thanks. Thanks, Harry. Thank you. Thanks for watching this CraterConf talk from the Mobile Edition 2016. For more information about upcoming conferences such as the one in February 2017, go to conf.crater.io to learn more.